Hi, I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. The government spent the week battling to win support for its workplace reforms. Changes it says are needed to get wages moving. Business groups say they'll slow the economy down. The senator with the deciding vote, David Pocock, well, he remains unconvinced. Meanwhile, cyber hackers started releasing information on the dark web this week stolen from Medibank. Hundreds of customers were exposed. Police say Russian hackers are to blame for the recent attacks and efforts have been stepped up to go after them. But there's also an urgent need to strengthen defences here. Later in the program, we'll hear from the Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill about what's being done. This week, I was joined on the panel by Jennifer Hewitt, Peter Van Onselen and Sarah Eisen. I want to come to those um, efforts to hunt down the Russian hackers, but perhaps we should start with uh, what we know about uh, Medibank and the safeguards it did or didn't have in place, whether it dropped the ball uh, here. In fact, here was the company's CEO talking to Virginia Trioli earlier in the week about how exactly this happened. The criminal stole a username and password of someone with privileged access to our systems. That's how they got in. That's how they got in. Uh, Sarah, it apparently just took the, the theft of a username and password for someone, an employee at Medibank, who has access to the whole system. We're talking about millions of files, sensitive data for all of the customers. Um, what do you think? Does that sound like adequate security? Oh, definitely. I think a lot of us, even in, I think, our profession, are used to multi-factor uh, authentication and so on and, and expect that... Let's just explain what that is, because, yes, we, when I want to log into my work computer from home, lot, yeah. you've got to put in your username and password, but you've also got to put in a second... Um, like a code or something, usually, Authentication. Right, like an authentication. It bumps to your phone and goes, hey, you've just tried to log in um, and, you know, this is this connected to you. Can you just confirm this is you? Um, so it's that kind of level of security that seems, at least for uh, myself and a lot of people that I know, pretty common. I, so for it to still be someone can just steal the credentials and get in and it is interesting. It's, it's unclear whether multi-factor authentication, as you exactly. say, very standard common, was even in place here. Yeah, exactly. It is interesting, though, you know, with the Medibank hack that it was someone who's just a credential broker, which is this whole new booming underground sort of industry where people are going and stealing credentials and they're not doing anything with it, then they're selling it on the dark web, which right. is what happened in this Medibank app, uh, with this Medibank hack. So someone went on, found this, made sure they had access, went to a Russian language site mm. and said, hey, I've, I've got this, and were paid an undisclosed amount by, by then a second criminal, criminal group, who then did the hack itself. So right. there are a couple of levels to that which are missing in previous attacks, um, like with Optus and so on. Is that a fail, Pete? How do you mean? For Medibank, not to have at least that basic, you know, yeah, I, I, for someone who holds access to the whole system. Well, and particularly given the nature of the sort of information that they have, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't sound like what they've done is as bad as what happened with Optus, uh, but it's higher stakes in terms of the information that they have. So, yeah, there's, there's fails all over the place here, whether it's the way that the government, and I'm not criticising Labor, they've only just got into power, but whether it's the way that the government deals um, with, with hackers and, and cyber security or whether it's the way that the corporates are dealing with it. Do, Jennifer, the government is beefing up fines for companies that don't have proper security in place. They're, they're pretty paltry fines at the moment of $2 million. They'll go up to $50 million once the legislation passes. But is there also an urgent need to do a bit of an audit of what big companies holding stacks of our data... Uh, what protections they do have in place. Oh, well, absolutely. I think uh, the fines are actually look, one aspect of it and it won't do any harm to have bigger fines. But really, it's the reputational damage that's going to be far more um, worrying to the companies and businesses that, you know, I speak to, uh, having really not paid enough attention to this issue. Boards, mm -hmm. management have not paid enough attention to this, despite all the warnings, and they're only going to get worse uh, with all these incidents. So I think, it, as well as the protections in place, they also have to be asking and having strict audits of exactly what information they hold, what information do they actually need to hold, mm. and for how long they have to hold it. And those types of questions have been just politely ignored. And it's not just uh, businesses, I think, are at fault. Individuals, too, uh, you know, they're happy to kind of hand over lots of lots of data as well um, because it, of convenience. And so we haven't... None of us have really thought this through. And this is the, the longer-term challenge, right, or the bigger challenge. Uh, companies holding too much data for too long. In some industries, though, Sarah, they are required to hold certain data for yeah. certain periods of time? Yeah, so I heard that from Medibank. I think we, we have heard that from big corporates that there are laws that are uh, making them hold that data. But in Medibank's case, they referred to some very specific 
uh, state and territory laws, ACT Victoria and New South Wales, that uh, go to the retention of health records. Even and for former customers? Even for former customers. So it's up to seven years um, of holding after sort of you leave that they need to hold that. And, you know, I've asked questions of Mark Dreyfus and so on saying, look, I know you're reviewing the big privacy laws federally, but what about these laws? And yeah. he's saying, look, there is engagement with state counterparts on this because, yeah, I mean, from all looking at the laws themselves, it does seem to check out that there is this requirement. Can, can I just say, let, let's hope that the political parties don't have, don't get hacked because they've exempted themselves from the Privacy Act. So they can retain all sorts of information for their party databases mm. in a bid to get your vote. Mm. They can do that without anyone's consent. They can put information on there that is not FOIable because they're a private organisation, but without all the protections that the Privacy Act provides for individuals when other organisations have information on them. We don't talk enough about this. Mm. Both major parties do it, and the kind of information that they have about people is incredibly invasive, but you can't get access to it. You can't even check if it's right. So mm. let's hope that the hackers don't invade their that's databases. In, 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 indeed. What about the idea that um, comes up from time to time, I think it's being looked at again, having some sort of national ID um, repository or database? So instead of all the companies, banks and insurers and phone companies having to collect our data, you have one place where it is securely held and th those companies can then verify against that. Well, it, it sounds, has problems it's, of its own. It, 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 look, that has problems of its own. It's, look, it sounds good in theory, and you'd have to hope, of course, that <laughs> that, that those systems were secure as mm. well. I, I think it, we're all kind of grappling with this, in, not just in Australia, but everywhere. Yeah. But, for example, in Australia, I think there's going to be a particular problem coming up because we're going to have the new consumer data regime, which is going to allow things like open banking, making it easier to um, for non-financial institutions to get access to data. Well, you, we know uh, banks have... Uh, you know, they have a, a, probably the most protections of, of any kind of corporate in place. They get hacked all the time. What about the idea that third parties then get access to that data? Open banking, that's great, except that what if they're the weakest link? Now, the banks are already saying we should rethink this. And, of course, people will say, well, banks would say that anyway. Well, it's a good point. But it is, it is going to be a problem, Well, because the banks spend a tonne on their yeah. cyber protections, fair enough, but those third parties maybe can't afford... Uh, mm. to have those same sort of protections uh, in place. So, And if there's a vulnerability there, yeah. then how does that spread? I mean, I think w we have not really kind of across this. And the, what is going to happen, clearly, is this is just going to get worse and worse and the attacks far more sophisticated. What about... Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, that's why this has to start with government doing more. Mm. And, you know, don't get me wrong, Claire O'Neill was dead right about the lack of action for years from the coalition. It will be interesting to see, though, what the new government is able to do because mm. it has to start with the government doing more more, because you can't rely on individual businesses, depending on how financially viable or not they are, that have yeah. private information to do it themselves. You mm. know, that becomes the equivalent of expecting people to put bars on all their windows uh, rather than have decent policing. So we'll see what they do, uh, but that's where it has to start. But that also requires the government to have a lot more oversight. Because yeah. um, you have heard from concern. you've heard from Aki and um, the Australian, you know, the one of the peak uh, business bodies, really worried about particularly for small businesses. We're looking yeah. at Medibank, we're looking at Optus and so on. Yeah. But you know, there are uh, it's a cyber crime reported every seven minutes. It's not always for these big corporates. It's all over. And in terms of cost and so on, like even Medibank didn't have cyber insurance because it doesn't work out. And that's another huge thing is regarding the viability of that particular market of cybersecurity yeah. insurance. And the, the, again, huge corporates. And then you're looking at anything bit below that also has to protect themselves. So it's an, it is an interesting thing and you do have to really look at what the government's going to do from the top down, how it's all going to be workable from, for every size of, of business. What about the decision to call out uh, these cyber hackers as Russians? Um, Scott Morrison did this a few times as well, you know, got angry and tough about the Russian hackers. Does it help to identify like that? Oh, I think that's more politics, to be honest. I mean, more helpful would just be to put in place legislation banning pain mm. uh, for ransoms, you know, when, when you have that What, situation. make it make it illegal? Well, make it illegal. No, I mean, no a lot ransom. of cyber experts say that's step one. Now, that doesn't get rid of all of it because they can still on-sell the information for... It's interesting. I, I, I did uh, talk to Alastair McKibben mm. uh, on, on Q&A the other night about that. He said, look, there are cases where it, it might be an option. That's where they've gone, the hacks have gone in and encrypted data and you're paying a ransom to ransom unlock. Mm. Yeah. Um, in this situation, Medibank, where it's already gone, well, no, don't pay the ransom, there's no point mm. there. Um, 
but you think it should just be flat out? Well, I think, I mean, obviously in life-threatening situations, you then have a discussion with the authorities, mm. but why the first step isn't that it's banned is beyond well, my understanding. Well, and, and what is, what is that, though, for a business who just sees their entire mm. business destroyed? Uh, w w do you have compensation for that? I mean, th there's all sorts of consequences to that as well. Oh, no, I get that, but at the end of the day, if you're allowed to pay the ransom, then that creates the business model in no small part. That's right. For the hackers. It does. I'll ask the Minister about that in a tick. Um, it's raised the question again, though, if these are Russians, why don't we kick out the Russian diplomats? We've been talking about that since the invasion of Ukraine, and that, that was put to the Attorney General yesterday. The Australian government is looking hard at Russia's diplomatic profile in Australia, and all options remain under consideration. Our preference is to maintain diplomatic channels, but diplomatic profiles must always be consistent with our national interest. Doesn't sound like they're going to be booted out. <laughs> Not quite. No. And I mean, I think it's interesting, uh, uh, right as uh, Rhys Kershaw, the AFP commissioner, got up to make the press conference saying these are Russians, the Russian embassy put out a statement being like, we haven't heard from the Australian government regarding this or the AFP. There's not really been those discussions. So there's this idea of this diplomacy and working together like, as much as you can, I suppose, but then... You know, you don't actually talk to well, the Well, yeah, Russian so don't, don't boot them out because we need to have an open dialogue, but, then, but we don't have an open dialogue. Yeah. Well, yes, Admittedly, a phone call be... probably wouldn't make a big difference. <laughs> no, uh, it wouldn't. But, 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 I mean, we've got the situation, very similar situation with China as well. I mean, that uh, it's yeah. just going to be very difficult for government. And to your point about politics, it is... Yes, th those those state um, those states yeah. kind of at least allow uh, much more of this to go on without um, without caring about it too much, and uh, I think that's just a huge kind of political problem. But it also makes it easier for um, an Australian government, for example, to say, "Look over there, don't look at what we're doing." Well, time to talk to the Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill about what is being done to take us there. Here was the Australian Federal Police Commissioner calling out the nationality, at least, of cyber hackers. We believe we know which individuals are responsible, but I will not be naming them. What I will say is that we'll be holding talks with Russian law enforcement about these individuals. It is important to note that Russia benefits from the intelligence sharing and data shared through Interpol, and with that comes responsibilities and accountability. Claire O'Neill, welcome to the program. So you've announced that this task force of Australian Federal Police and Australian Signals Directorate personnel will be now given a permanent remit to keep going after the uh, cyber hackers. Are you giving them extra resources or powers as well? Thank you, David, and good morning to you and your viewers. Uh, Mark Dreyfus and I announced with the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday that we're setting up a permanent standing operation, a partnership of new policing between the Australian Signals Directorate, which are the cyber guns of the Australian Public Service, and the Australian Federal Police. This is an entirely new model of operating for these two organisations. What they will do is um, scour the world, hunt down the criminal syndicates and gangs who are targeting Australia in cyber attacks, and disrupt their efforts. Um, this is Australia standing up and punching back. We are not going to sit back while our citizens are treated like this way mm. and um, allow there to be no consequences for that. OK, just to be clear, though, this task force has been in place for a while, though, hasn't it? No, that's incorrect. Okay. So this is a new operation, a permanent standing force of 100 of the best... Uh, most capable cyber experts in this country that will be undertaking this task for the, for the first time, offensively attacking these people, David. So this is not a model of policing <clears throat> where we wait for a crime to be committed and then try to understand who it is and do something to the people who are responsible. We are offensively going to find these people, hunt them down and debilitate them before they can attack our country. What's your expectation here of what they'll be able to <clears throat> achieve? Because, you know, we know whether it's in this new... Uh, standing operation or in mm -hmm. you know, their previous task forces. Um, they've been trying for a while to go after these hackers. The Americans have for years. They did manage to arrest mm -hmm. a few of them uh, about a year ago. What's your expectation about what they'll realistically be able to achieve? Yeah. Well, I think there's a perception in the community that um, it's, it's hard to do anything about mm. cyber attacks, and that's actually wrong. Uh, there's an enormous amount that we can do. I think we need to shift away from the sense that the only um, good outcome here is someone behind bars, because that can be hard when we've got people who are uh, essentially being harboured by foreign governments and allowed to continue this type of activity. Uh, but what we can do is, is two really important things. The first thing is hunt these people down and disrupt their operations. It weakens these groups 
groups if um, governments like ours collaborate with the FBI and other police forces and intelligence agencies around the world. But the second important thing that we need to do is stand up and say that Australia is not going to be a soft target for this sort of thing. And if people come after our citizens, we are going to go after them. So when you say they're being harboured by a foreign government, you're saying <coughs> the Putin regime is harbouring this, these criminal gangs? Well, I think there's plenty of public reporting that would suggest that in some cases there is um, turning a blind eye. Um, sometimes it goes beyond mm. that and it's not just Russia. Uh, but, David, this is a really important new crime type for our country. I mm. wish we had been further along than we are now, but I can tell you we have done more about cyber security in this country in the last three months than was done in the preceding three years, without question. OK, but the attacks have been escalating, particularly on big companies, Optus, Medibank. Do you think the efforts so far are working? And just coming back to that question mm -hmm. around what's your expectation? Is this new team going to be able to stop these sorts of big attacks that expose our data? Yeah. So I don't think anyone can promise that cyber attacks are going to go away. And one of the things that people need to understand is really how relentless this is at the moment. We had National Australia Bank come out a, a month or so ago saying they are subjected to 50 million cyber attacks a month. The ATO is subjected to 3 million cyber attacks a month. So we've got to understand here that we have got to adapt our whole approach um, mm. and our whole thinking about this new crime type. Um, cyber security is hard and it's got to be a partnership between business, government and Australian citizens. And so what we need to do and what I need to do in my job is drive a whole of nation effort where we see all mm. of these groups in the community lift up their defences together. Let's turn to what's being done here yep. to protect uh, our data, keep it safe. Medibank's chief executive, as we just saw, says it was the username and password mm -hmm. of an employee who had high level access across the network that was stolen. Yep. Does that surprise you, even alarm you, that mm -hmm. that's all it took to get into the, the, the database of millions of customers? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to provide a running commentary about the technical aspects of every cyber event in Australia, but I will say I think what we saw with Optus and Medibank is two Australian companies that hold very personal information about Australians and that means they owe big obligations to Australians to protect that information and in both of those instances the proof is in the pudding. Uh, that the information did get out and that tells us that proper protections weren't in place. Now, I have so had... Medibank did not have proper protections in place? Well, I have been quite direct about what I see as um, these two companies not having fulfilled their duties. But what I would say, um, David, is that we've got to come at this conversation with a sense of humility. Um, government holds more private information about Australians than anyone else in the community and we've got cyber issues that we need to fulfil here. Um, so what I would like us to do is come together as a country and have the discussion, which you just started out before on the couch, about what we can do across our country to help this. Just let me, let me make one more quick point. This is a global problem, David. 2022 has been the big wake-up call for Australia. If I look at the US, it was probably last year where they had a number of really big attacks that brought home the personal impacts of this to their citizens. So it's time for us to wake up out of the cyber slumber and I want to push our country now to do better. OK, but just to be clear on Medibank, was this a sophisticated attack? So there are two criminal investigations underway at the moment into Optus and Medibank and it's not helpful for me to provide a running well, you, commentary. You did on Optus. I, you, you, I, I, you said it was just, not yep. a sophisticated attack. So in mm -hmm. relation to Medibank, was this a sophisticated attack? Look, David, I um, am very direct about how I communi communicate about these things. I have, I have been direct in my discussion with Medibank and Optus. There are criminal investigations on foot now. I've made it clear that I don't think mm. the defences were where they needed to be. But I say again, we've got to come at this conversation with a bit of humility here. Government's got to step up to the plate too and this is a whole of nation effort Just here where we a, need to improve. a bit of a different tone to what we heard from you on Optus. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, I don't accept there was any difference in tone. I, I've said right. pretty clearly that both companies needed to do better. Both failed. Um, and I think both have come forward and apologised. I don't think Optus mm. and Medibank are saying anything different. Will there but be any fines? It's important that we do accept that there is, a, mm. there is a countrywide problem here. And as I said, 50 million attacks a month at NAB. We are, as a nation, being attacked virtually mm. constantly and yeah, we need no, to work together to fix that. Will there be any fines? I know you're trying to increase the fines, but the ones that exist at the moment. 
for, for either Optus or Medibank? Yeah, so that, that's not my decision. The Privacy Commissioner will make a decision okay. about seeking fines there. Um, you're looking at ways to stop companies holding too much data for, yep. for too long. Tell us a bit about what you're looking at there and whether this idea of some sort of national ID database mm -hmm. um, or bank is, is, is an option. Yeah, so just on the data, that's something the Attorney-General and I are very concerned about. Um, I heard from lots of constituents during both Optus and Medibank where people hadn't even been a customer of those organisations for sometimes up to a decade and still were contacted to say that their mm. data had been hacked. So what this is for us is a national vulnerability and what we need to make sure is that companies are only holding data um, for the point in time where it's actually useful mm. and the data is otherwise disposed of. So Mark Dreyfus is undertaking a review of the Privacy Act at the moment and he is looking at that. It's a complex question because as you noted on the panel, there's a lot of state and territory regulation about the retention of data that mm. needs to be taken account of. So that's something that will be looked at in the context of the Privacy Act review. And paying ransoms, you've, see, you've advised companies yeah. not to pay ransoms mm. to hackers. Should it be made illegal? Look, just on ransomware uh, payments, so uh, I think it's pretty um, clear that Medibank were right not to pay the ransom because if I have never seen people that lack a moral code so clearly than the hackers who are releasing data about and Australians data really online. Gone, right? yeah. yeah, and the idea that we're going to, you know, trust these people to delete mm. data that they have taken off and may have copied a million times is just frankly silly. Um, so I think that was the right decision and we're standing strong as a mm. country against this. We don't want to fuel the ransomware business model, David, and that is what happens when ransom. So would you make it illegal to pay a ransom? So what uh, the way that we're thinking about about the reform task, which is quite clearly needed here, is a bunch of quick wins, things that we can do fast, and the standing up of the police, um, new police operation is one of those. There's some really big policy questions that we are going to need to think about and consult on, and we're going to do that in the right. context of the cyber strategy. So, so you'll have a look at that? Yeah, so we'll have a look at that. At whether to make it illegal. That's correct. OK, let's move to some other issues. The uh, migration. During the week, you announced a yep. review of Australia's migration system, <coughs> which will help you develop, uh, you say, a new national strategy for migration. Yep. Uh, it sounds pretty broad. What's it about? Mm -hmm. what, what are you trying to achieve here? Yeah. So if you look at our country, we've never done anything big or important or meaningful um, in the last hundred years without asking the best and brightest from around the world to come and help us do it. Uh, and when I look at the migration system today, you know, we've come into office, this system is genuinely in a state of disrepair. It has no strategy. We've got enormous complexity in the system, literally, um, you know, hundreds of different visa categories and subcategories. It's expensive, it's complicated, it's bureaucratic. It's not working for migrants, it's not working for business, not working for the country. Now, when we look at Australia's future, we've got some really big challenges we're facing, transition to a climate neutral economy, uh, we've got to increase our productivity. We've got to recruit a caring workforce from around the world. And given the context of our region, we need to build cyber, um, sovereign capabilities in a few key areas. The migration system is not the full answer to any of those things, mm. but it's part answer to all of them. So I want to get this system working for the country. Look, one of the big problems, and you've identified this, is the long processing time yeah. for uh, bringing in skilled workers. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how long uh, yeah. some of the, the, the wait time is at the moment. Various suggestions <coughs> out there to speed things up. Get rid of the skills list mm -hmm. and simply say to business, you've got to pay a higher minimum salary threshold and mm -hmm. then you can bring in who you want. Yep. Is that a good idea? So it's um, certainly something that the strategy uh, will look at. And if I can just explain a little bit further for your viewers, you know, one of the things we've got to do is make a shift in our thinking. We've spent almost the whole of the last decade in a big conversation about immigration, about how to keep people out of our country. We are in a global competition to attract the talent that we need for the future with the US and Canada and New Zealand and all these other countries. They are rolling out the red carpet for the migrants they need. In Australia, it can take you two or three years to get a visa to come here and then we're only going to let you stay for a couple of years and send you back again. So we've actually got to think about uh, this as a, a competitive mindset where we want Australia to be a destination of choice and that's not what the migration right. system is doing at the well, moment. We'll see what that review comes up with. Uh, temporary protection visas, you mm -hmm. promised to get rid of them. Yeah. When's that going to happen? So it is a promise. Um, we've got um, a number of people living in Australia on temporary protection visas who have been here, you know, for, years. for more than a decade. Yeah. And I think there's um, real desire in the community to allow those people to have some sense of permanency. So when will you do that? That was a commitment that we made at the election. And we're working through it slowly and carefully, David. And I hope that your viewers see that one of the hallmarks of our government is deliberateness, deliberateness uh, calm, methodical focus, and we are working through can you give us how a time we can frame do that. Because I've heard from yep. some people on the, in this situation, been here a decade, yep. still in limbo. Yeah. When, like in the next 
six months, next year? When mm -hmm. are they going to be given some permanency? I'm, I'm not going to give you a time frame. I'm just going to tell you that we've committed to doing it. We will do it, but we're going to do it calmly, methodically and carefully. What about the so-called legacy caseload of 9,000 mm -hmm. or so people who came by boat back then mm -hmm. uh, but were denied a refugee visa, found not to be a refugee, people like the uh, Billa Wheeler family? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to them? Um, look, that's one of the complexities that we're still working through, David, and um, what, you, what you find when you come into office and the immigration system has been woefully neglected for almost a decade yeah, so is it's that on your watch this, now, this is, so what, this is 9, one of the issues. There's about 9,000 of these people. Yeah. What are you, you're not sure what uh, to do? I don't have a straightforward answer to you yet. It's a really, really okay. complex and difficult problem. We're five months into a new government, David. We will work through these issues over time. Okay, but this, this has been a problem for a decade. Mm -hmm. We'll work through it over time. Your junior minister, the immigration minister, Andrew Giles, has reportedly been the star attraction at some Labor Party fundraisers uh, in the lead up to the Victorian election, um, fundraisers to raise donations from Tamil and Indian communities. Are you OK with that or do you have a problem here? Um, David, uh, raising money is, is a part of the work that we do as members of parliament. Um, this is but not, using the immigration this, minister this as is the not a, card, This is, is not a Labor or a Liberal thing. You know, I look at the Teals and the Greens, they're raising far more money than I ever have for my campaign. But I'm asking here about using the yep. immigration minister as a draw card to rattle a tin from ethnic communities. Yeah. Is that different? Is that a problem? Um, I don't see it as being any different, David, and I'm actually um, unsure, so you're okay as, with uh, I'm unsure as to why this is garnering media attention. I mean, last night around the country there were probably half a dozen member of members of parliament doing exactly the same thing, and I'm actually not they're, sure they're, why they're this They're not the immigration the minister. I'm specifically mm -hmm. asking about using the immigration minister mm -hmm. as a fundraising draw card in ethnic communities. Mm -hmm. No problem? Yeah, again, I'd say, um, David, this is, this is a part of our role, and Andrew is going to community events um, and talking to community groups this is part of our job as members of parliament and I'm, it's certainly no different to what I've seen uh, previous and I'm not sure why this is garnering media interest, honestly. So this, honestly. Is, this is a... This is part of, part of the work that we do. Uh, finally, a number of community groups and local mayors in Western Sydney uh, mm -hmm. have been concerned about the decision to resettle mm -hmm. families of ISIS uh, fighters in their suburbs. <clears throat> now, you've, you've made it clear that you've done this based on national security mm -hmm. advice. I accept that. Mm -hmm. But what about their concerns mm -hmm. in Western Sydney? Um, are you going to or have you met mm -hmm. with any of them to discuss what's what's mm -hmm. happening? Um, well, a decision like this is, I think, always going to be um, one where there are different views expressed in the community and I absolutely respect people's right to have a different view. If I can just explain uh, what the Australian Government has done, has brought back uh, four women and 13 children, the oldest of which is a 13-year-old girl, um, to resettle back in Australia. What I really want people to understand about this is that the people at the heart of this issue here are Australian citizens. And the reason I make that clear is because these people will be able to come back to Australia. They can demand, as of right, an Australian passport at any time. The, the national security question for us is do we want these children growing up in a squalid refugee camp where they have no access to health and education, where they are subjected every day to radical violent, violent ideology that tells them to hate their own country, or do we want them to grow up here with Australian mm. values? I'm, I'm so asking, that's, that's the choice okay, for us. But just, just quickly on this, I am asking about the concerns yeah, in the communities, yeah, which and, are, are legitimate. Yeah, yeah, Why, uh, are you going to meet with them? Why haven't you met with them? Yeah, so I've, I've talked to the members of parliament who um, have raised those concerns, and if there are other members of parliament that I haven't spoken to... Are you going to talk to the mayors and the community apology. leaders? The so so the, the person who has been most vocal on this is Di Lee. Um, I'm organising a detailed briefing from my department about um, the Why arrangements that have been made. Why don't you go to Western Sydney, though, Minister, and, and yep. talk to the... Yazidi and Assyrian yep. leaders and say, look, here's why we're doing what we're doing yep. and here's the monitoring that's in place. Why don't sure. you do that? So what I've spoken to the members of parliament who represent those areas about is um, just having a discussion about what the most constructive way for me to engage with those communities is. And I'm happy to okay. do that, David. It's okay. part of my work and I understand that this announcement will have different impacts on different types of Australians. I agree. I've got those obligations. All right. So you're open to doing that. Mm -hmm. Claire O'Neill, thanks for joining us this Thanks, morning. David. Thanks so much. All right, let's get back to our panel. We're joined once again by Jennifer Hewitt, Peter Van Onselen and Sarah Eisen. Uh, look, just picking up on the... Um, it feels very dark. Here, here we go. Uh, <laughs> picking up on the Medibank uh, front. A couple of things there, just quickly, uh, Pete. Uh, open to making um, paying of ransoms illegal. Well, and it sounds like that's where it's going to go because you assume that there's briefings afoot and if they were not going to go down that path that the minister would have shut it down. So there's going to be complexity if they're going to make it illegal. There'll be exemptions and all sorts of elements. But I'd now be surprised, based on what she said, if they weren't going to actually go down that path as opposed to just keep it open. And I think um, just on Medibank and the criticism there, they've, they, you know, it, it was a little tougher, I think, the language there from the minister, Sarah, about 
Medibank failing in terms of the protections that should have been in place. But there's clearly also a bit of caution there about, look, you know, we, we all need to share blame here. Mm, absolutely. And I think you were right to point out, I do think the language was stronger on Optus for sure. But I think the, the minister was getting quite a lot of uh, frustration and a lot of opinion from the uh, industry, the cybersecurity industry, about this idea that the Optus attack was sophisticated and they called it such and so on, and that being a bit mm. of a conflation, whereas we didn't see those sorts of things as much with Medibank. I do think there's a little bit of a change in language there. But as we are learning more about it and are asking the relevant questions like, you know, multi-factor authentication, could these things have been used? You can see the ministers getting a little bit stronger, but with ongoing investigations from the AFP and so on open, not taking it too far at and that point. One of the things that's happened as well, my understanding was that when she was so strong in relation to Optus, mm. uh, in the briefings, one of the points that was made to her was be careful because governments uh, are just as likely yes. to get hacked. Happens. And when that happens, when you've been so brutal about the private sector, how's that going to look? Which and is, I think which is why is that, that line of that. humility. Cooperation. Humility. Yeah. You can I think see that shine through, right? Yeah, yeah. And exactly. it was also interesting what she said about the, uh, you know, uh, the criminals being kind of having this safe haven in, in Russia. She was making that quite yeah, clear, yeah. which I thought was interesting, only because the AFP commissioner said, oh, our message to these criminals is we've got a lot of rungs on the board in bringing overseas criminals to justice sort of thing. But we had, did just sort of hear from the minister, well, that's actually very, very difficult and they are yeah. given impunity and they are allowed to operate pretty freely. Doing that is super difficult. And the way to attack this is actually through, yeah, making it hard for them through those disruptions from the task force and so on. Yes, doing what those clever uh, <laughs> cyber experts are doing that's probably beyond me. Uh, let's turn to the government's industrial relations uh, battles in the parliament. It's still hopeful and I've got to say from my conversations, pretty confident it will be, be able to get this through by the end of the year. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister is arguing this week that in fact Australians, uh, Australian voters voted for these reforms. The Australian people voted for our plans to get wages moving again. The Australian people voted for these reforms. Now the Australian Parliament can do the same. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill reflects the mandate that Labor won on the 21st of May. Does this, Jennifer, reflect the mandate that Labor won at the election? No, not at all, really. But it's a great political slogan, isn't it? Get wages moving again. Everybody thinks, oh, that's a good idea. But they certainly had a mandate to get wages. Well, they talked yes, a lot about but, wages. But in, in terms of how they do it, of course, and that's where the difficult part is. And uh, there's so many problems, I think, with this industrial relations bill. Uh, I'm um, actually amazed that they, they've, uh, their overreach has, has been so uh, extreme and their urgency so great. I assume that's because they realise that, one, if they split it, but also if they delay it, the the kind of antagonism to many of the unpopular details of the bill will just grow and the questions uh, about it. And I think that's going to be... Um, they may or may not get it through the parliament. Uh, they're probably, they've already had 150 or so amendments to do this, so they may get a little bit more. They may persuade David Pocock or Jackie Danby that it's worth supporting. Uh, but I think the risk of what they've done um, will, will play out in the economy I, I wanna, for a long I'll time. I come back and explore the, those risks that you're talking about. Pete, what do you think? Well, I, I take a slightly different view on the mandate question. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I, I have problems with the bill, I can see them. I, I also don't think that it necessarily will get wages moving, or at least not without industrial disputes to go with it. But I, I, my view is that when you elect a Labor government, you know that they're going to go down this path shortly after they get into power, unless they explicitly rule it out because they're, they're sort of taking a different view. So Labor governments change the IR laws in their favour, uh, or in the favour of the unions, in the favour of workers. Do you think, do you think most I voters, that. Do you think most voters expect I think things so. like multi-employer... No, 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 not, not on the detail, but if you vote Labor, you know that you're going to get Labor IR laws to follow. Uh, so they don't have an explicit mandate, mm. but it's sort of, it's implied, I think, for a lot of voters. I think it's that thing, isn't it? It's, it's getting wages moving and, yes, industrial relations, but, like, exactly what it is. They are pretty huge, this multi-employer bargaining, particularly the single interest stream. And we heard uh, this week that, you know, Senator David Pocock, in estimates, was asking quite uh, specifically of the department, when did you start drafting this? Because we want to know, given the Labor has said this is a mandate, so how far back does this go? Mm. And a lot of these details, particularly the multi-employer and so on, were after the Jobs and Skills Summit. And you can see um, that is playing into also what Pocock thinks of it and so on, and that was playing out this week in those estimates. Well, one of the concerns, David Pocock, who we should explain, is, is the 
pivotal vote here. We saw it in the uh, package at the top of the show. Um, Labor needs the Greens plus one more vote to get mm. this through the Senate. Jackie Lambie doesn't sound too interested, but David Pocock is in play. Uh, now, he is worried about the definition of small business here. Uh, at the moment, the, the legislation suggests that no one, no business with up to 15 employees could be roped into a multi-bargain, uh, multi-employer bargain. Um, but the 15 includes part-timers and, and David Pocock's point is that's going to include, um, uh, well, it's still going to include a lot of small business. 97% of uh, Canberra businesses are small businesses, less than 20 people. So it has been raised as a concern and, you know, something that we're, we're looking into. We're consulting widely on and really important that we, we get that part of it right. And so this is where the deal, it looks like, if it's going to be done, will be done. And I think the government's still open to a bit more movement uh, on this in the, in the final days before it comes to a vote. Um, as I say, from what I'm hearing, they're, they're pretty confident they'll get there on this. Do you think they will? I think so. They're not going to let the perfect, in their eyes, be the enemy of the good on this one. Yeah. They're, they're going to try to get this passed before Christmas. The optics of that matters to them. Mm. Uh, the outcome of actually having it legislated matters to them as well and to the union movement that supports the Labor Party. So I think that they will compromise in a way that they will nonetheless not see as compromising the bill. And let's not forget, whenever Labor puts IR laws in play, there's a fair bit of fat and ambit in the legislation to begin with. So David Pocock might think that he's got some wins, mm. but if, if, if Tony Burke was given a sort of where do you want to end up, I reckon what he's already likely to get with compromise is more than he probably thought he would originally get. So anyway. it might end up being 15 or 20 full-time employees. Yeah, yeah. And still that's not going to be that much. Really. Look at, let's look at the two claims being made in this argument. Jennifer, you, you mentioned the overreach uh, here. What is the specific... Um, problem for, for business. What's this actually going to mean, do you think, in reality? Well, there are two... There are, well, there are many elements to this, of course. Uh, so one of the issues that the government's been on about is... Uh, and, and getting a lot of sympathy for is the fact that uh, the highly feminised workforce in the care industries are um, have been underpaid. Well, nobody's going to disagree with that. What they're far less vocal about is that much of the, the employers in this industry are, in fact, governments or incredibly influenced by government policy. For example, child care, then you have childcare workers, for example. Everybody says, oh, childcare workers aren't paid nearly enough. They're far less vocal in saying, oh, well, that means either greater government subsidies than we're, than we're already planning to come into effect from July, or parents paying more. So yeah. there's that issue. But for business, all these claims then, about mining and yes. other sectors being at risk, what's really going to happen there? Well, we're not going to go back to the 1970s and national strikes and things like that. But there is no doubt that the unions are very... So are some of these business claims overblown? Oh, yes, yeah, some of them are overblown, but, but the government's claims are mm. more but overblown. But just sticking with business for now. We'll so the, the, but, but there is no doubt that, um, that there will be... They, what they're trying to do is loosen the ability of individual businesses mm. to, to bargain with their workforce. And, and there's no we're... link between productivity mm. and wages growth. And that is just not sustainable. Well, that's, that's fair because we haven't seen... Uh, and we'll come to the wages argument in tick, but we haven't seen any figures around what this will do for productivity. But it seems the business groups haven't put out any you know, specific example of... This company uh, would... This is what would happen at this company under these changes. There's, there's, it's just a sort of... Well, because it's kind of partly because that's so kind of uncertain and mm. the areas are so grey. But what what, they, what business does know is that there will be more attempts to rope a whole lot of individual businesses in. And the government's saying, oh, no, they won't necessarily have to be. Well, given what the, what the bill says and what the government's intentions are and what the unions are saying, I, don't, I think they're right to be totally suspicious that that, that kind of line will keep on growing. As for the government's claim and the union claim that this will get wages moving, um, well, the opposition asked a question of a uh, senior departmental figure in Senate estimates hearing about that. Is it actually going to get wages moving? Have a look. Was any modelling undertaken in relation to the impact of this legislation on wages? Um, Senator, in terms of the ability to model down to um, particular figures for um, what, in terms of wage growth, the the information and the resources, the information and the data points really aren't there. The data points <laughs> aren't there. What so no, <laughs> uh, basically no. I mean, look, 
Is it too hard to model? Is it the... No, it's not too hard to model. You can model almost anything. They just didn't do it because it was an ideological point that Labor wanted to put this law in place so they didn't need the modelling nor care to have it. It's intuitive that it'll get wages moving, but it's also intuitive that it'll, it'll see disputes mm. rise as well. And, and those two things are often... They often go together. Uh, so that's just the reality of it. Mm. Let's turn to summit season. The Prime Minister's in Cambodia for the uh, East Asia Summit uh, and the ASEAN Summit. Then it's the G20 in um, Bali and then APEC in Bangkok. Uh, the big question is, will he get a meeting with China's President Xi Jinping? Um, all indications are it most likely will happen. Uh, and there's a, a, an expectation, I think, on the Australian side, from, from my understanding, that, that, that it will happen either on the sidelines of the G20 or the sidelines of APEC. Here was the PM last night. We've had the foreign ministers of Australia and China, as well as the defence ministers, have a meeting. If the leaders of our respective countries have a meeting, uh, then that would be positive. Uh, there are no preconditions for a meeting. Uh, I look forward to having a constructive dialogue if a meeting takes place. I've always said that we'll cooperate with China uh, where we can. It would be the first leader official meeting in six years since Malcolm Turnbull was PM. Um, it's not going to be able to solve all the differences and clearly Anthony Albanese is you know, not about to back down on any of, any of Australia's concerns. Nonetheless, it would be pretty significant, Jennifer. What would it mean, do you think, for the relationship to have the two leaders finally meet? Well, of course, this comes uh, with Penny Wong uh, about to address a, a big uh, dinner this evening to commemorate 50 years of diplomatic uh, recognition. Uh, so I think China and Australia are both interested in it, but neither wants to give way in a sense of their, their own kind of idea of their national interests. And unfortunately, that's still a long way away. So yes, dialogue's a good idea. It's always a good idea. But to expect there's going to be any kind of radical change out of it, I think um, perhaps it's not, not radical realistic. change, but um, well, it, just the the atmospherics may improve a bit. The atmospherics, but also it, it might then lead to some softening. You would think on the trade sanctions, uh, for example. I, I mean, mean, the trade sanctions, you know, uh, that that's also working through a, a World Trade Organization process. I think in the first quarter of next year, we're expecting a report on the barley situation, and then mm. in the second half of next year, we'll hear about the wine. So that's all happening. So if it's even if we don't have these meetings, there it is kind of happening in the background as well. But uh, you're right, I don't think this one meeting is going to change, you know, the $20 billion worth of trade sanctions we have. But for all the government leaders, including the PM, Defence, Foreign Affairs Minister, Trade Minister, to be able to pick up the phone and go, hey, you know, the panel is, the WTO panel is going to put this report in. Are we sure we can't bilaterally just work this out together? It changes that dynamic. I think so. So you're not able to say, look, this one meeting between Xi and, and Albanese, it's going to do all this. But in terms of that dynamic, mm. in terms of being able to pick up the phone, I do think it's really important, particularly, as I said, as these WTO processes become closer and closer to, to concluding, it does become sometimes more and more attractive for countries to work this out just bilaterally. But you do need to be able to pick up the phone. And China also is, is wants Australia's backing, or mm. not its opposition, to joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and at the moment, that is not possible. Uh, but both Japan and Australia are kind of strongly opposed yeah, to that. and Australia's... Uh, so say, there's they're a, not a going bit to of a trade-off trade there. Australia's not going to be um, shifting its position on that. The one meeting the Prime Minister decided not to attend is the COP uh, climate talks in Egypt. Uh, of course, Labor gave Scott Morrison a fair bit of grief uh, about whether he should go to the Glasgow Climate Summit. This one, yes, is a bit of a different summit. And yes, he's, he's very busy, but you know, Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak, they're all pretty busy leaders as well and, and uh, they're finding time to be at the summit. Do you think he should be? Oh, look, I think this was about domestic politics. I mean, whether he likes it or not, there has been so much international travel for Anthony Albanese since he became Prime Minister. I, I just think that there was a calculation made, given that he's now headed overseas again, not to go to that, not during a, a sitting period as well. Because what, Australians don't want him travelling well, so much? Or, no, just, or because I mean, climate in particular? The opposition is... would start doing the equivalent of Kevin 747, you know, sort of airborne elbow or something. So I, I think that they were it's aware of that elbow. reality. Mm, yeah. But him going overseas at the beginning of, you know, right after the election worked out very well. Oh, yeah, I him. agree. You know, in terms of he, he actually looked really great on the international stage. Him sitting with Biden really was something that boosted a lot of confidence in him. So to kind of continue that momentum, I know there's that risk, absolutely. But, I mean, the Labor was already ready for that coalition attack regarding, oh, where are you going and what are you doing, um, 
and had a lot of, you know, quips for, well, when you were in government, you disrespected nations and mm. you, the water lapping at the door comment was in, in Parliament this week as well. So It's just such a cheap political attack line, the whole... Well, speech, it is a know. cheap political attack line, but, but the other thing with, the, uh, with what's happening at, at, today, at this year's COP is it's so different from last year's mm. and, and the fact that so much was promised last year and it just hasn't been delivered. So I think expectations for this COP are pretty low. But There's I mean, going to be a lot of yeah. blame going around. The Prime Minister has also made a, a big deal about how the change in government, the change in Australia's climate position has uh, unlocked so many relationships diplomatically that it's put Australia back on the, you know, the world stage, allowed us to engage, uh, you know, as an adult and so on. He's made this point and then it, we also want to host this thing in, in a few years' time, so not going to these climate talks looks a little odd in that respect, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's just that risk calculation, like Peter was saying as well about how it's going to be weaponised, the mm. fact that the industrial relations reforms are some of the biggest in two decades, it's no small thing, you know. He did eventually meet with Pocock as well, that was something he hadn't even done since July. He wouldn't have been, like, potentially been able to do that if he was travelling as well. It's a pretty big... There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah. a lot going on. And, and look, one of the big issues um, and most contentious issues at this COP is the question of what are called loss and damage payments. Mm to developing countries to deal with the impacts of climate change. Australia's keen to have that debate. Uh, we'll see what it means ultimately. Peter Dutton, though, has made it clear where the coalition stands on this. Prime Minister, the coalition has ruled out paying compensation to other nations for the effects of climate change. Will the Albanese government also rule out signing Australia up to compensating other countries as part of the deal being negotiated at COP27 in Egypt? One of the things I won't do is in front of a boom mic, make a joke about our island neighbours. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that I won't do. I won't do that. And I won't do that because I want to build good relations with our Pacific neighbours. Yeah. Yeah. Gave it back to him. <laughs> yeah. uh, there it was. Pete, what does it tell us, though, about Peter Dutton's approach on climate change? Well, he's, he's going to play politics with it and he's going to go hard on it. Uh, and why not, in the sense that within his party, uh, the rise of the Teals has seen the demise of the moderates within the Liberal Party. Uh, you know, there, there are more climate sceptics now as a percentage of the coalition team than there were before the election, and he was always one of them. And I also think that question of compensation is very sensitive domestically, uh, particularly when you've got all these... Um, the, everybody's bills pressure. going up, and, you, and, 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 and I think Peter yep. Dutton understands that perfectly well. Yeah, all right. Our panel, Jennifer Hewitt, Peter Van Onsel and Anne Sarah Eisen, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with crowdfunded cartoonist, the one and only Glenn Lelivra. Morning, Mike. Glenn, uh, the environment may be copping a beating, but politicians are copping it too as they uh, gather for the COP27. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, I'm with the protesters on this one. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when the whole thing's over, I'm planning on gluing myself to uh, Chris Bowen. <laughs> Uh, it'll be a bit awkward because it'll have to be my non-preferred uh, hand, but at desperate times, Mike. Lovely Mark Knight has got the opening act is um, ACDC to you. Humanity is on the highway to Climate Hill, so to open the show, it's... Uh, the boys. At yeah. uh, You know, um, I don't know why Mark didn't go with Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap. It's a know, long way to the cop if you want to sell your soul. It's a long way to the cop if you want to sell your soul, precisely, yes. I did love this Mac Golding. Uh, um, it's just, you know, the parable of the boiling frog. It is. And it bizarrely, is. the frogs knew of their fate. And yet did bugger all. But of course, as the saying goes, frogs in glass saucepan shouldn't smoke coal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's this guy? Who is this guy, Glenn? Your, your cartoon, run us through this. Uh, this is called uh, Walk Like an Addiction. Right. But if you could actually decipher these hieroglyphics, I bet they would just say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, <laughs> Enough. stop it. Enough already. Yeah. Well, the bangles, of course, you know, came straight to mind. Walk like an extinction. <laughs> <laughs> Should have gone with walk like an extinction. Uh, a beautiful David Pope rebuilding the bridge to the neighbours and um, Anthony Albanese. You can tell it's a fair dinkum bridge. It's even got its own trouble with... Um... No. 
climate compo. <laughs> yeah, bridge too far this one maybe. Yeah, well, two, we're, we're, in this cartoon we've captured two of Australia's major exports, natural gas and bullshit. With industrial relations on the uh, agenda, Tony Burke's sure got his work cut out, Glenn, at the moment. Loves a guitar. Loves a guitar. Yes. Tony Burke's IR blues in the key of EBA, ABC, ACTU, AWA, ACCC, Lambie, Pocock, <laughs> LNP and quite a lot of LGBTQI, NRLW, Afrocagilistic, XBLA, etc. up tempo. Yeah, um, excuse me while I tune these guys up and uh, we've got Lambie and Pocock and I can't quite see who that is. I don't know, it's a teal, it seems to be a teal pegs. I did love this, Pocock makes a pretty big enforcer. Comrades. It's time to show the bosses in the other place the power of collective action. National Eddie. Union of Independent Senators. And uh, beautiful Brian Harradine up here. Oh, good get. And the banner underneath is show me the money. Industrial action brewing at the business people's collective. Lovely Cathy Wilcox. Ah, uh, the BPC. Yeah, yeah. What do we want? Maintain the status quo. When do we want it? Ongoing. Yeah, protect our profits. My, my board, my bonus. Take it or leave it. Pay rises, inflate prices. We're the workplace, you're the bargain. <laughs> Who will think of the shareholders? I think where the workplace or the bargain should be a T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Pundits in the US predicted a uh, red wave in the midterms, but instead the Republicans have been left feeling a little bit blue. It was more like a red ripple. It was a puddle. Brett Lethbridge, no wave. He's got Trump here ready to surf in on the Trump 2024. Sad. Sad. Lovely Peter Brolman. Shh, he thinks he's storming Congress again as he's uh, going into the retirement home. Trump fail at the midterm elections. <laughs> if retirement homes are jail for old people, mm -hmm. does that mean jail is a retirement home for failed politicians? Well, maybe. 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 Glenn, it's been a great pleasure on picking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Thanks, Mike. Back to you, David Spears. Glenn, thank you, and Mike as well. Let's get some final observations. Sarah. Something that I don't think has been picked up that much this week is regarding Afghanistan. Um, Senator Penny Wong in estimates revealed that we're going to do a review into the locally engaged employees program, which is everyone that worked with us in Afghanistan all of last year. We were talking about how all of these people were being left behind. That review is going to happen. It's pretty significant in the fact that it is actually trying to address all of those problems. So hopefully we'll be back when they want it to be early next year and it will make a change really quickly to get more people out of Afghanistan and, and into Australia. Very interesting. Very interesting. Tate. For a long time there's been a grouping of rural and regional Liberals that have met because they were small within the Liberal caucus. Uh, but now there's a new group of metropolitan Liberals that are meeting because they're now smaller than the rural and regional Liberals because of the Teals and losing marginal seats to Labor. Metros. There's only 15 of them uh, and they've met. They met on Monday for the first time. They're going to meet each sitting period. They met uh, Peter Dutton. He's one of them. He turned up and addressed them at this breakfast meeting last Monday. Uh, Scott Morrison didn't turn up. They've got various issues that they're concerned about that, you know, they think that the Liberal Party perhaps aren't doing enough on. Uh, and their one edict when they met, because they are, of course, Metropolitan members, just like the ABC, they wanted to have some good coffee. Very good. Jennifer. Well, for all the focus on international relations this week, Anthony Albanese is going to come back to one of the biggest domestic problems uh, that's going to face him, and that is what to do about the price of electricity and gas. Uh, there aren't too many good options there, and it's also going to mean that Labor is going to have to uh, confront its rather split personality on the role of gas um, over the next uh, several years, uh, including uh, the Victorian government in particular, uh, actually refusal to countenance it. Yes, and they're promising a decision by the end of the year, so a bit to pack in in the next few weeks. All right, finally, I want to note the death of Peter Reith this week, a major figure in Australian politics for many years and a guest on this show as well. Our condolences to his family. Also a shout-out for the winner of the Australian Political Book of the Year, Telling Tenant Story. It tells the story of Tenant Creek and makes an important contribution to the debate about an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Author Dean Ashenden beat a strong field, so well done. Don't forget to check out our Insiders Back to You podcast in your feed this weekend. I'm talking to Jane Norman and Josh Zepps. Send us your questions for next week. You can do that via the ABC Listen app or an email to backtoyoupodcast at abc.net.au. Finally, Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has plenty of worried users and advertisers bailing out of the platform. What about politicians? We'll leave you with Dan Tian's advice. Thanks for watching. It's a gutter. So my advice would be, if you don't like it, get out of it. And um, are you are you still on there? I I am still on it, David. <laughs> what I do is I poke the bear every now and again. I just oh, say. I want
wide, wide, wide. Oh, wide, wide, wide. wide, wide, wide. wide. I mean, it's a gutter. It's a gutter. You've got to admit get what it is. Well, get out of the gutter. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.